My name is Sonia Michelle, and I'm Director of United States Studies here at the Wilson Center, and I'm really delighted to see all of you here today. You didn't melt <laughs> in the process of getting here. It's really, really to be commended. It's either, it's always something, it's either snow or heat or something, but living with weather extremes. Um, in any case, we're delighted to have all of you here for this discussion of Dorothy Roberts' new book, Fatal Invention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Recreate Rates in the 21st Century. We're really very pleased to be able to hold this event at the Wilson Center, and I understand from Dor Dorothy that this is the first, her first discussion of the book, her first public discussion devoted specifically to this book, so we're really very pleased to be able to do that. And I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the Black Women's Health Imperative, the president of which uh, uh, Eleanor Hinton uh, Hoyt is sitting next to me, and you'll hear from her in a few minutes. Uh, the New Press, the publisher of this book, and Professor Roberts herself, who all of whose generosity made possible the lunch that we've just enjoyed. So you can thank them for that. Uh, just to quickly note that book copies of the book are on sale outside. Maybe you've already gotten one, and Professor Roberts will be available to sign afterwards. So <clears throat> I'm sure she'll be happy to do that. The Wilson Center, for people who are, or for those of you who are not familiar with it, was founded in 1968 as the nation's living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. And in keeping with the model that he set in his own life, the center's mission is to foster dialogue between scholars and policymakers. Um, Wilson, as you may know, was a, a PhD, he was a professor, he was president of Princeton before becoming governor of New Jersey and then president of the United States, and he is, our, to date, our only president with a PhD, so we like to think that he really embodied the value, he understood the value of scholarship as well as the value of public service. Now, bringing to creating a dialogue between scholars and policymakers uh, is not the easiest thing to do. Um, it takes many forms, things like this, book launches, panels, conferences, and so forth. Um, and when we bring scholars, particularly to the table, we often bring to light information or interpretations of our 28th president that are less than flattering. As I like to say, the Wilson Center, unlike the other presidential memorials in this town, uh, is not just made out of mar marble, this one talks back. And when it comes to President Wilson, there are some choice things to say about his attitudes toward race, which many of which have been said uh, at different uh, events that I've organized. Uh, I looked in the index to this book and I don't see President Wilson, so it looks like, <laughs> looks like he, got through, he got through this one <laughs> unscathed, but I'm sure there, uh, others may know uh, of information about him uh, <clears throat> and uh, his attitudes toward race relations. Um, but fresh scholarship often brings with it critical perspectives, perspectives that may make us feel uncomfortable and that's as it should be. Reading Fatal Invention, I found myself provoked on nearly every page, forced to rethink many ideas about race and race relations that I thought I had worked through. And I found that my staff had the same reaction. We've been having an ongoing seminar for the last few weeks as people have been reading the book and saying, "Did you? what do you think about this and what do you think about that? And we all grappled with um, the many insights that Professor Roberts presents in the book. Let me just quote one of the many statements that stopped me in my tracks. On page 25, she says, quote, race is the product of racism. Racism is not the product of race, unquote. Just think about that for a minute, and I think she'll probably explain what she means by that. But it's a very provocative, it, it, it encapsulates a lot of what she's saying in the book, and I think it really uh, is something to think about. As you'll soon hear for yourself, uh, selves, this is but one of the many bold ideas that this important new book advances. To discuss it, we're fortunate to have with us today both the author, Dorothy Roberts, who has flown in from searingly hot Chicago to an only slightly cooler Washington. She actually thinks this is cooler. Uh, and she said she was in Miami a few weeks ago, and that was even cooler than Chicago, which is pretty amazing to think about. Uh, and we also have with us two experts who are going to approach the study from different angles. Uh, Vanessa Northington Gamble, who is University Professor of Medical Humanities and Professor of Health Policy in American Studies at George Washington University, and then Paul Butler, who is a Professor of Law at George Washington University. So they each have a unique perspective on the book, and I'd be very interested to hear their remarks on it. Introducing Dorothy Roberts will be Eleanor Hinton Hoyt of the Black Women's Health Imperative, uh, and our format will be as follows. I will introduce Ms. Hinton Hoyt. She will introduce Professor Roberts. Professor Roberts will have about half an hour to present her book, and then she'll be followed by comments from Professors Butler and Gamble. I've asked each of them to speak for about 15 minutes, and then we'll open the floor for discussion. You have bio sheets in front of you, so I don't want to go into extensive introductions, but let me just uh, say a few words about Eleanor Hinton Hoyt. 
A champion of social justice, she focuses on reducing health inequities. She's been president and CEO of the Black Women's Health Imperative since 2007. She's not only a leader herself, but works to engage other black women as advocates in the fight against HIV, AIDS, and breast cancer, and in the struggle to advance black women's health, black women's well-being in general. She also produces and hosts the blog talk radio show Black Women's Health Report with Eleanor Hinton Hoyt. And what, uh, well, she'll, maybe she'll tell us what, how we, what, rate, what station that's on so we can hear it. And she works with the White House on domestic violence, and somehow in the midst of all this, she also time, finds time to be an author. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Eleanor Hinton Hoyt. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And let me thank you and uh, the Woodrow Wilson uh, Center for uh, allowing the Black Women's Health Imperative to co-host um, this discussion today. Um, one of the many pleasures and honors I have to meet and greet as well as introduce uh, fabulous women and sometimes a few fabulous men if we can find them uh, as we have here today. <laughs> Uh, is, is my role as president of the Black Women's Health Imperative. And I won't say much about that, except that we are, and we, we, we're going into our 29th year, and so we will be celebrating our 30th year soon, and you'll be hearing about that over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, and um, we're the only national nonprofit organization that is devoted solely to advancing the health and wellness of black women. And today, I have the pleasure of presenting to you Dorothy Roberts, who continues to intrigue and inspire us to go beyond ourselves, to go beyond what we think we know, and to, be go, to go beyond our comfort zone to understand that race, where most of us dare not go or fear not to go in a discussion, uh, is, in her words, an invented political system, not a natural biological division. And in introducing her, I thought I'd share a story about her. Uh, and this is, this is short, but, it, but it, it, it will intrigue you and it will help you understand who we have before us today. Several years ago, a feminist author traveled to Northwestern University, where Dorothy is a distinguished professor of law, the Kirtland and Ellis Law Professor, to interview Dorothy on her work in reproductive rights, uh, choice, and social justice issues. And as the writer traveled to Chicago in sub-zero weather, she expected their, that their conversation would take on the issues of what we know, Roe v. Wade, Griswold versus Connecticut, abortion and birth control. Instead, the writer became the recipient of Dorothy's benevolence, a really long discussion about welfare reform, government subsidized health care, high incarceration rates of children, black men, black folks, public education, slavery, and of course, predominantly race was at the center of this discussion. And the writer said, in reading this story, I could just figure, I, I, I saw her sitting there. Uh, the writer said she politely listened while sipping a latte in a quaint coffee shop near Northwestern, while all the time thinking, what in the world is Dorothy talking about? <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, it is truly an honor that we are about to hear from a thought leader, an expert, and a scholar who researches, examines, and analyzes issues that will possibly make some of us think, what is she talking about? <laughs> but it certainly will push us beyond our comfort zone. That are far from being black and white, yet Dorothy is always able to present them to us in black and white. And that's what I like about hearing and talking and loving Dorothy. She helps us grasp the understanding of what many of us do not want to understand. And so through the years, we've been blessed. And, and I, I consider this a blessing because Dorothy serves as the chair of the Black Women's Health Imperative. But we've been blessed with her wisdom over the years. In her book, Killing the Black Body, Reprodu Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty, 
She tackles the less talked about side of the battle for reproductive rights, the social and government control, as you know, of, of African American women's bodies uh, uh, through the years, and this was published uh, late 1990s. Then in Shattered Bonds, The Color of Child Welfare, which is really her, her issue, as well as all of the others, she offers a sharp probing look at the alarming public policy that separates children from troubled, low-income black families while making efforts to keep similarly troubled white families together. And now in her latest book, Fatal Invention, Dorothy discusses how America Decades after the Genome Project proved that human beings are not naturally divided by race, is standing by and letting the emerging fields of personalized medicine, reproductive technologies, genetic ge genealogy, and DNA databases resuscitate race as a biological category. And so what we have here today is Dorothy Roberts. For me, and I've known her for many years, more years than I'm I'm willing to admit. <laughs> and I've had the privilege of working with her as a board member of the Black Women's Health Project for the last five years that I've been there, and she was there before me, and that says something about her age, not mine. <laughs> and since January, when she became our board chair, so hello, uh, what a leader do I have here to follow? <laughs> and I admire her. In brilliant interplay of race and class and gender and legal issues that we all think about, talk about, and, and sometimes muse about and almost never write about. But I also know her as one of the most humane, uh, the most humble, the most warm spirit and general, uh, genuine women of the world, and I say of the world. But what I did not know until I finished uh, speaking at a medical uh, convention uh, uh, last year uh, in Florida, in hot uh, Florida, when a woman came up to me and said, I, I, I hear that Dorothy Roberts is on your board. And I said, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, this is before she became board chair. And she expressed her excitement to me that Dorothy was on the board. And in her words, she said, Dorothy is a lioness, you know. Well, I didn't. Uh, but then I thought about it. A lioness is the pinnacle of a true hunter, hunting until it quenches its hunger and its thirst. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dorothy Roberts, a true hunter of the truth, hunting until she reveals all the facts that we know, thought we knew, and maybe don't want to know that lead, leave us with a new and vast understanding of what it means to be human. Dorothy Roberts. Thank you so much, Eleanor, for that amazing introduction. I've been introduced many times. I've never been called a lioness before. <laughs> I'm very, very grateful to be able to launch my new book, Fatal Invention, in this forum. I'm very happy that the Woodrow Wilson Center and the Black Women's Health Imperative could team together to sponsor this, and I'm grateful to Sonia Michelle and Eleanor Hinton Hoyt, both of whom I've known for many, many years, uh, for coming together to sponsor this event, also very grateful to have comments from such esteemed professors as Vanessa Gamble and Paul Butler. Uh, so I appreciate it and I appreciate all of you coming out in this sweltering heat to hear what I have to say and to discuss this topic. In Fatal Invention, I claim that we are witnessing in America a new racial politics that relies on redefining the political system of race in biological terms using cutting edge genomic science and biotechnologies. I argue that this refurbishing of old racial classifications with new scientific garb not only perpetuates a false view of the meaning of race and of humanity, but also helps to obscure racial inequality in the United States. From 18th century racial typologies to 20th century eugenics, 
science has always been instrumental in perpetuating and justifying the concept of biological races, and this century's genomic science is no different. There is a new twist to it, though, which is that today's racial science claims that it is using more accurate, precise measures at the molecular level, and importantly, that it's doing it without the taint of racism. So it's accomplishing the same end of justifying a biological concept of race, but doing it more accurately and without racism. As I write in the preface of Fatal Invention, the emerging biopolitics of race has three main components. First, some scientists are resuscitating biological theories of race by using cutting-edge genomic research to modernize old racial typologies that were based on observations of physical differences, like skin color, hair texture, uh, size of the cranial uh, capacity, that sort of thing. Uh, now instead, looking for differences at the molecular level, which we can't see with the naked eye. Science is redefining race as a biological category written in our genes. Second, the biotechnology and pharmaceutical industries are converting the new racial science into products that are developed and marketed according to race and that incorporate assumptions of racial difference at the genetic level. And the third component is that government policies that are officially colorblind are stripping poor minority communities of basic services, social programs, and economic resources in favor of corporate interests while simultaneously imposing on these communities harsh forms of government surveillance and punitive regulation. These dehumanizing policies of surveillance and control are made invisible to many Americans by the emerging genetic understanding of race that focuses attention on molecular difference while obscuring the impact of racism on society. This is the convergence of race, politics, and science that I find most dangerous. Scientists are searching for racial difference at the molecular level precisely at a time when politicians claim, and many Americans believe, that there are no longer any barriers to racial equality at the societal level. About six years ago, I started to notice stories about racial discoveries or scientific discoveries that purported to validate the biological validity of race. Uh, for example, I attended a prestigious lecture at Northwestern Medical School that invited a conservative political pundit who was known for his arguments that race differences at the genetic level determined intelligence and athletic ability to contest the claims of a well-known geneticist from Howard University, uh, some in the audience may know who I'm talking about, who has argued strenuously that there are no biological races in the uh, human species. And it alarmed me. It alarmed me that uh, we were at a point where it was thought necessary to have a debate about what I thought had been established that there is only one human race. Also alarmed me that this pundit was invited to share an endowed prestigious lecture at the medical school, uh, despite his outrageous claims about genetic inferiority based on race, or he, he might say difference. Uh, they're just differences in intelligence and sporting ability that uh, happen along racial lines, but they're rooted in genetics. I wondered how these claims could be true. My parents, to whom I dedicate Fatal Invention, had always taught me that there is only one human race. And this has always meant more to me than just words or a scientific 
imperative since my childhood. As a scholar and activist, I studied and seen firsthand the injustices made possible by separating people into different kinds of human beings. So I undertook this book project as a personal challenge uh, to my conviction that race is a political system. I wondered if my own beliefs about race would withstand interviews with leading genomic scientists. I wondered if it would withstand the enthusiasm of some uh, African Americans and left-wing uh, political activists who believe that race-based biotechnologies are promoting health. After five years of intense research, reading mountains of scientific studies, talking with experts, and really questioning my own beliefs and thinking about race, I found not one shred of evidence that counter the political nature of race. In fact, my journey only strengthened my understanding of our common humanity. I found that there were still some aspects of race that I linked to biological difference, that when I studied the genetics of human diversity, I realized that they just showed that race is not at all found in our genes that even those traits that maybe subconsciously I still link to race could be found throughout humanity. And they weren't segregated by race at all. As Eleanor mentioned only a decade ago, the biological concept of race seemed to have finally met its end with the Human Genome Project and Bill Clinton's famous statement that it showed that all human beings, regardless of race, are 99.9% .9 the same. Contrary to popular misconception, we are not naturally divided into five or six genetically identifiable groups. Biologically, and I think it bears saying again, there is one human race. Race applied to human beings is a political division. It's a system of governing people that classifies them into a social hierarchy based on invented biological demarcations. Race is a social grouping created to support slavery and colonialism, and its boundary lines have shifted over time and across nations to suit political ends. Just as an example, the racial classifications that the census uses, the official federal government racial classifications, have changed more than 20 times since 1790. Not because of discovery of some change at the genetic level, but because of political reasons that the groupings, uh, the, the, the boundaries, needed to shift in order to take account of certain political ends present at the time. But reports of the demise of race as a bi biological category were premature. Instead of hammering the nail into the coffin of this obsolete system, the science and technology that emerged from sequencing the human genome was shaped by a resurgence of interest in race-based genetic variation. The Human Genome Project could have focused on what makes genes work in human beings. Instead, at the very moment it was unveiled, uh, some newspaper commentators and researchers decided that the mission should be to find out how genes work differently in people according to race. So let me highlight some of the ways in which this new racial biopolitics is developing in genomic science and biotechnology that I present in greater detail in Fatal Invention. Some scientists claim that computer-generated 
gene clusters reveal the fundamental structure of human populations and that that fundamental structure maps onto the five main human groups that are traditionally thought of as race. But if you look at these studies, you will see that they depend on the instructions, the algorithms, the genetic samples, and the assumptions fed into the computer program. So for example, just a basic one, a program called Structure depends on how many groups the computer programmer tells the program to cluster the DNA data set into. It can cluster it into 5, 6, 2, 20, uh, and we could say then, oh, there are 20 races. There are, there's one race or there's two, five or six. The one that got newspaper headlines, of course, was five because it uh, seemed to map onto five human races. And of course, the headline said this was verification that everyday concepts of race really are rooted in genetic structure. But I would say what the studies show is that there are multiple ways that we could slice up human genetic diversity. What we think of as race is only one possibility, and in addition, what we think of as race is a social grouping. So it can't, it can't be written in our genes because it's a social grouping that depends on legal and political definitions. Attempts to avoid the controversy of race by using instead the term geographic ancestry have tended to repackage race rather than replace it. I don't think it has to, but uh, many scientists, instead of using geographic ancestry to refute and substitute the concept of race in their research, instead are equating them as the same thing. Myths about racial differences in disease result in deadly medical stereotyping in doctor's offices. There is a long history in this country of defining disease in racial terms, in particular uh, medical claims that black people have distinct diseases and that we experience common diseases differently because of genetic, for genetic reasons. Now, I make the point in the book that race as a political category does have biological consequences, including health disparities, but those result, I argue, from the impact of social inequality on people's health. Doctors uh, and medical students are still taught to treat their patients according to race, and racial inequities plague medical care in this country. For example, I think one of the most striking examples is that studies show that blacks are less likely than whites to receive pain medication for identical injuries uh, because there is still a myth that blacks are impervious to pain and also it seems as if do some doctors believe blacks are more likely to become addicted to uh, certain types of pain medication and therefore prescribe it less to black patients. Blacks also wait longer to receive life-saving treatment for a heart attack and are less likely, uh, are, I'm sorry, more likely to die while waiting for a transplant. Scientists are searching for genes to explain racial disparities in health that are actually caused by social inequities. And in these studies, they routinely use sloppy, inconsistent, and ambiguous definitions of racial categories. Sometimes they begin categorizing the subjects of the studies in social terms using self-identified race, but by the end of the study, they're claiming to find uh, genetic differences based on race using a biological definition of race. They tend to leap to genetic conclusions without ruling out more logical social explanations of health disparities. So recent studies have pointed to genes as the cause for higher rates of black infant mortality, 
breast cancer, high blood pressure, and asthma among blacks. At the same time that a less reported body of research is showing the unhealthy effects of everyday racial discrimination. Next, the pharmaceutical and biotech industries are exploiting race as a convenient but unscientific proxy for genetic difference to market new drugs. The theory is that we haven't yet achieved the promise of gene-tailored medicine, personalized medicine, and so in the meantime, race can serve as a proxy because it reflects inherent or genetic racial difference and so it's becoming a linchpin for turning the vision of tomorrow's personalized medicine into today's profit-making drugs. One example is the Federal Food, Food and Drug Administration's approval of the first race-specific drug, a heart therapy, that is prescribed to black patients, but I argue for commercial reasons. This drug was not developed for black people. It was not developed for any particular genotype. And the clinical trial that was presented to the FDA for its approval only involved African Americans. So based on the clinical trial, you could not claim that the drug worked any better for blacks than for anybody else. Why did this drug change? from a race-less drug to one for black people because in order to extend the patent on the drug, the inventor had to change the first patent in some way. And so he changed it by adding that it was for an African-American patient. All Americans, regardless of race, are increasingly expect expected to become bio-citizens who assume full responsibility for their welfare through the consumption of gene-based goods and services. And we are seeing an ascendancy of the idea of genetic determinism, that genes determine everything, not just health, but increasingly researchers are claiming they determine behavior, including voting. Uh, and gang banging uh, and other, so teen pregnancy, absentee fatherhood. Uh, and so the combination of claims that everything about us are determined by genes and that we should control our lives by uh, using genetic products with the increased redefinition of race as a genetic category, those two work together uh, to try to convince us that we should be focused on technological solutions to social problems as opposed to social change. A popular ancestry testing industry gives customers the false hope that a cheek swab can trace their racial roots to four major population groups which map on to race. By splitting customers' ancestral origins into racial per percentages, genetic genealogy companies reinforce the myth that human beings were originally divided into pure races. These technologies are plagued with scientific errors, but they also misplace the meaning of our identities in genetics as opposed to social relationships and political relationships. I understand why many African Americans look for their heritage in Africa, in a particular part of Africa, using genetic technologies because most of us are unable to do it using the historical records that other people are able to use. However, I, my position is that what links black people together in solidarity and links us to our African homeland is not our genes. It is our common experience of racial oppression and our common struggle 
to end it. And I'm concerned that focusing on genes as what ties us together is contributing to a dangerous view of race and identity as rooted in biology as opposed to rooted in moral commitment and social relationships. The new Jim Crow system of mass incarceration and the expanding genetic surveillance that supports it exemplify an expanding genetic surveillance and brutality against communities of color. State and federal authorities are amassing giant DNA databases that increasingly make innocent individuals permanent suspects and disproportionately place black and Latino communities under genetic surveillance. I think many people have ignored this buildup of DNA databases because of the good that DNA identification has done in the criminal justice system. It's helped to exonerate more than 200 wrongly imprisoned individuals. But there's no evidence that the massive collection of DNA from people who are only arrested or who have only committed minor offenses makes us any safer, nor is it worth the cost of expanded government surveillance, laboratory errors and backlogs, and reinforcement of racial stereotypes. Again, think about it. We are living in an age where the government is collecting DNA disproportionately of blacks and Latinos because blacks and Latinos are more likely to be arrested and detained by government agents. And now it's extending to family members under familial searching where when law enforcement authorities find a partial match in the DNA database, they look then to relatives of the person whose genetic profile partially matches. So now you're including relatives in addition to the disproportionate numbers of blacks and Latinos who are already in the database. That's happening at the same time that scientists are claiming that crime is caused by genes and at the same time that they are looking for racial uh, uh, genetic definitions of race. Uh, I think that that is a very dangerous convergence that reinforces stereotypes that people of color are prone to crime and seems to justify the mass incarceration of blacks and Latinos in this country, which surpasses, far surpasses, the level of imprisonment anywhere in the world and ever in the history of Western democracies. So, why are we seeing this resurrection of biological definitions of race and what should we do about it? I want to close by reading a couple passages from Fatal Invention that uh, attempt to answer those questions and then um, we can hear from the commentators and, uh, and discuss this even more. How should we view the progression of racial science that brings us to the doorstep of a new genomic concept of race? Are the errors of the past, the legend of Ham, Cuvier's racial typology, craniometry, eugenics, the products of flawed racial methods that today scientists have corrected with advanced genomic theory, state-of-the-art computing, and giant DNA databases? Did Blumenthal happened to devise an accurate classification of human races in 1795 despite using faulty techniques? The answer, there are no biological races in the human species, period. That conclusion was confirmed by the most ambitious research project on human biology yet undertaken, the Human Genome Project a mountain of evidence assembled by historians, anthropologists, and biologists proves that race is not and cannot possibly be a natural division of human beings. Think about the origin of the concept of race, the way racial groupings have been reconfigured over time, 
or their differing meaning around the world. Race must be a political category. Why then do most Americans cling to a false belief that biological races really do exist? Why do they latch onto whatever trivial proof they can muster to confirm their misconceptions about race? I'm not referring to redneck white supremacists who spout vitriol about the inferiority of colored people. Many of my left-leaning colleagues, for example, balked at my book project. Of course we should be working toward racial equality, they said, but what if scientists are able to identify races genetically? Racism is a faith. That it, it was the summation of George D. Kelsey, the prominent black theologian who mentored Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Kelsey argued that racism initially arose as an ideological justification for colonialism and slavery, but gradually heightened and deepened in meaning and value so that it pointed beyond the historical structures of relation in which it emerged to human existence itself. The same can be said of race itself, the system of human classification that facilitates racism. As Sonia mentioned earlier, uh, I point out in the book that race, is, race does not create racism. It's not as if we're naturally divided by race and if we treat it the wrong way, we'll be racist. Racism produced race. Race is only necessary to impose a system of racism. It's the only reason we have to divide people up into five groups. Race started as a crude device for parceling people into servant and master classes whose historical roots and scientific rationales we now reject. Yet race was, has outlasted its original historical context because it developed into a deeply held belief about the nature of human beings, a belief that continues to be useful in ordering our contemporary society, and a belief, by the way, that sci many scientists ha hold. They hold it not because they've discovered it, they held it since they were children. <laughs> Because as toddlers, we're all taught to divide people up that way. According to folklorist Judith Newlander, for a, folk, for a folk story to persist, it must contain elements that can be modified without changing what the tale is about, enabling it to dodge later discreditation. Science has been responsible for giving racial folklore its superficial plausibility by updating its definitions, measurements, and rationales without changing what the tale is about. Once upon a time, human beings all over the world were divided into large biological groups called races. What does the path of common humanity mean for all of us? We should reject the notion of biological citizenship based on genetic ties and consumption of biotechnologies that allow us to manage our welfare individually at the molecular level. Instead, we should forge a notion of citizenship based on our common moral commitment to end racism and other forms of social inequality that recognize social change cannot be accomplished with a technological fix. It is the belief in fundamental human equality that inspires many people to fight collectively against racism and its dehumanizing practices. Locating the causes of inequality in social rather than genetic structures liberating because it is much easier to change society than genes. It is more enlightened to understand the potential for political alliances apart from biological distinctions than to believe we are inevitably divided and shackled by in immutable differences programmed in our genes. Will Americans continue to believe the myth that human beings are naturally divided into races and look to genomic science and technology to deal with persistent social inequalities? Or will they affirm our shared humanity by working to end social injustices preserved by the political system of race? I think this is the most pivotal question facing the nation in the 21st century and why I wrote this book, because the answer 
will determine the basic nature of the relationship between citizens and the government and with each other. One path is already leading to aggressive state surveillance, extreme human deprivation, and unspeakable brutality against whole populations on the basis of race. By obscuring this coercive control over poor communities of color, the new racial biopolitics permits the growth of state authoritarianism and a corporatized definition of citizenship that endangers the democratic freedoms of all Americans. We must choose the other path of common humanity and social change if we are to have any hope for a more free and just nation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorothy. You've given us so much to think about and uh, to guide us a little bit in our thoughts. We have two wonderful commentators. Uh, let me introduce both of them, and uh, then they will both speak. Uh, our first commentator is going to be Vanessa Northington Gamble, who is University Professor of Medical Humanities and Professor of Health Policy in American Studies at George Washington University. She, is, she too, is a champion of equity and justice in medicine and public health. She has not only gained an international reputation as an expert in the history of American medicine, racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare and bioethics, but she has also performed major public service in leading the campaign to secure an apology in 1997 from President, from President Clinton for the U.S. Public Health Syphilis Study at Tuskegee, which was conducted earlier in the 20th century. Our second commentator will be Paul Butler, who is Carville Dickinson Benson Research Professor of Law at George Washington, where he teaches criminal law, race relations law, and jurisprudence. On three, occasion, uh, on three occasions, law school graduating students named him Professor of the Year. As a federal prosecutor with the U.S. Department of Justice, his specialty was public corru corruption, and he brought many people to justice. <laughs> <laughs> so watch out. Um, and his provocatively entitled book, Let's Get Free, A Hip-Hop Theory of Justice, not only won the Harry Chapin Media Award, but has also won accolades from the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, and Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates. So we have two wonderful commentators. I'm going to turn the floor over to them first, Vanessa. Thank you for inviting me here, and it's just an honor to be on the same um, platform and be able to discuss the wonderful work of my friend and colleague, uh, uh, Dorothy Roberts. And um, I have been in uh, the audience when Dorothy has discussed this work, and uh, let's just put it this way. Uh, you might not see the slings and arrows, <laughs> but they are there, and that she has a way of having a great armor meaning in, in the terms of her intellect and her commitment to these issues to ward off the slings and arrows. Um, my comments uh, on this panel are going to be from my perspective as a historian of medicine, as a physician, um, and uh, a bioethicist, and as a former member of the National Advisory Council for Human Genome Research. So many of the things that Dorothy talks about in her book, I have witnessed um, firsthand and can understand some of the challenges that, that, that we face. First of all, I'm, I'm going to start as a historian of medicine because one of the things that I think that Dorothy has done is that she has powerfully demonstrated that race is a fluid concept. Vanessa, can you speak more into the mic, mm -hmm. please? That it's a, is that better? Okay. That it's um, a fluid concept that has been influenced by social, political, and legal factors. Well, when I, for, um, since 1997, I have taught a course on the history of race in American medicine. It was the first course in the country that looked at these issues. And when I started the course, one of the things I decided to do, we had to have a discussion of what is race. And um, it's, you know, as historian Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham has said, when we talk about the concept of race, most people believe they know it when they see it. <laughs> but arrive at nothing short of confusion <laughs> when pressed to define it. 
And I think one of the things that Dorothy has done in this book has shown the confusion, uh, the changing concepts of race, and, um, and how it really has been a moving target. So in this class, I have students talk about what is race. And um, the first time I taught the class, it was before the Human Genome Project had been mapped. So I said, you know, I said race is a political social construct, and a student said, wait until the Human Genome Project is mapped. And I said, well, maybe after it's mapped, it'll show that you and I are more biologically connected. Mm -hmm. Then I pointed to a phenotypically black woman, and he had this look of confusion, horror, I think because he thought that I had called him black. But after a semester with me, I think he realized that was okay. <laughs> um, but th the point is that uh, when we talk about race, we really most times don't know what we're talking about. And I think that includes the scientists who have become the authority on this, this issue. But the thing that we have to remember is that science, even today, is not enacted and conducted in a neutral, value-free space. I mean, one of the things that I loved about Dorothy's book when she talks about the faith of race, mm -hmm. that, you know, that somehow we have this faith that it exists, that we know what it is, and many of us, many people think that it's something that is in our genes. Before it was in our genes, it was in our blood. And that as science changed, the language of race has changed. So in the 18th century, when all scientists had was observation, it was based on observation. When the technologies change, for example, having things such as stethoscopes, x-rays, that they were also used to look at difference. And so now we're at the point in terms of the human genome project. And I was at a meeting at the White House where President Clinton said that we are 99.9% .9 the change, the same, and that we can use this as a way to erase discrimination. That was as, as I think Dorothy has, has really shown in her book in a, ver in, a, in, a, in a very powerful and very well-researched way that that optimism was misplaced. Now, one of the things, too, that comes up in the book, and if you look at this historically, it's true, that scientific and medical concepts about race have influenced fears beyond race and medicine. Mm -hmm. In terms of having who was freed, who was enslaved, in terms of black inferiority. Who could or could not become a citizen in terms of uh, looking at uh, uh, Chinese and Japanese? Who could or could not come into this country based on people believing that Mexicans were diseased and would, uh, because of, their, uh, uh, of their, their bodies? So that this has been an ongoing um, uh, discussion and, and, and not just in medicine, but in political and legal uh, realms. Bioethicist and law professor Patricia King talks about the dilemma of difference. And what she means by the dilemma of difference, and I quote here, in a racist society that incorporates beliefs about the inherent inferiority of African Americans in, contra in contrast to the superior status of whites, any attention to the questions of difference that may exist is likely to be pursued in a manner that burdens rather than benefits African Americans. So we need to talk about the dilemma of difference. And I think one of the unintended consequences of our, our interests in pursuit of trying to eliminate racial and ethnic disparities in health and health care has been a reemergence of looking at biology. That, so I, th I think that it's not just the Human Genome Project, 
but that at this time, this particular time in our country, that there have been many people interested in trying to eliminate racial and ethnic disparities in health and health care. Now, one of the things that I think how this shows how that even people of goodwill can disagree is with the, the whole Bido episode in terms of, and I was one of those people who had problems with it in terms of, as Dorothy pointed out, the methodology, it was reifying race as biology, but I also heard people talking about it's our drug, don't take it away from us. That black people are dying of heart failure. We need to do something. So that, so that there are clashes here. Now, one of the, the highlights for me of the book is that it shows the tenacity of race as biology even after the mapping of the Human Genome Project. It happened before, but that, that it's tenacious. But, and, and I think Dorothy puts that out on the table. One of the things that's there that I don't think Dorothy puts out on the table, but I'm going to put it out there, is that there's also been a tenacity of the opposition to these ideas. So that when science changed about, you know, that, you know, biology, that, uh, that race is biology, there has been an opposition of uh, sometimes in the black community, the black community in collaboration with progressive whites. So that there has been um, an ongoing um, movement to fight these ideas. For example, um, Dorothy mentions in her book um, um, uh, Frederick Hoffman. Frederick Hoffman wrote the book Race, Traits, and Tendencies of, of Negro American. And he talks about things like race traits were like immorality was a race trait. Um, and that um, he worked for Prudential Life Insurance. So for many years, Prudential did not insure black people because they believed that black people were going to die off. We kind of fooled them, but hey. <laughs> um, and so it was Metropolitan who many black people had their life insurance from because Metropolitan saw a market opportunity. But there was a concerted effort against the ideas of Hoffman. For example, W.E.B. Du Bois talks about, is this racial? What's meant by this? acknowledging that there was differences in disease and death rates in African Americans, but he says, the question, is it racial? Mr. Hoffman would lead us to say yes, and to infer that it means that Negroes are inherently inferior in physique to whites, but the difference can be explained in other grounds other than race. For example, Du Bois talks about the high infant mortality rates in Philadelphia at the turn of the century as an index of social conditions. So that, this, so that the opposition was there. And one of the things, if you look back into the turn of the 20th century in terms of black opposition to these uh, ideas about race as uh, biology, is that it was a collaboration of not just black scientists, but black activists. It was seen as a political act. Health was a political act. And that it was not just limited to, um, to the sciences and, uh, and the medical doctors. The other thing, I would put Dorothy in this group of people in this book as having been in part of the opposition to race as biology. The, uh, the, the other person in the work that she's meant, she mentions in her book is that of Nancy Krieger. In terms of getting us to understand how oppression can literally be embodied in one's, bo in one's body and how there can be biological expressions of economic and social inequality. So the question is, you have a disparity, what causes it? And I think what, what has happened is that biology trumps everything. Race trumps social um, uh, conditions. And so that I just wanted to bring out the point of the tenacity of these thoughts. The other thing that I, I want to, to bring up is 
some of um, the where we are today. And one of the, my concerns is that, you know, I think Dorothy has, has given us an, a, a, a brilliant, well thought out study about why this is important. I think it's a clarion call. But I think where the struggle is, what do we do? And how do we do it? You know, as I said, I sat for three years on the National uh, Human Genome um, um, uh, Council. And I remember when there were these grants going on for centers on ethical and legal and social implications of the Human Genome Project. And what was very interesting, many of the projects had to do with race, because race was a hot topic. Came, in many ways, became a hot topic because of the interest in disparities. So I am at, um, I am at um, a site visit for a place I'm not going to mention. And so they said they were interested in race and, you know, and what this means in terms of, of racial and ethnic disparities in African Americans. So I said, this place, this school, this university has a very vibrant African American studies department. Have you talked to them? No. Have you talked to the economics department? No. So it was talking about silos, and the, and the grant was funded, even though I tried not to get it funded, but um, <laughs> because, you know, it, it was a good grant for a limited body of work. But that if we really want to eliminate racial and ethnic disparities in health and health care, I think that we have to go broader. And I think one of the things that happens sometimes is that science becomes the trump card. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, the scientists say X, Y, or Z, and that the, the messier uh, um, attributes are not looked at in terms of looking at class, where one lives, um, what kind of work one does in terms of where one's, how one's mother uh, and father lived in terms of the impact uh, uh, on your life. The other thing that I think that Dorothy has shown in this work is the importance of language, the importance of language and concepts. I mentioned the word race and about how, you know, people are confused or we can have tensions in terms of the, de the development uh, um, of the word, that in terms of uh, the use of the word ethnicity, there are some people who say, well, we, well race uh, doesn't exist, so let's use the word ethnicity. And at the same time, what people are doing is, is taking concepts that are based on race or the history that was based on race and putting the word ethnicity to it and saying, let's, you know, we, we can all be friends now. <laughs> um, but that I find that problematic in terms of just saying, you know, and it's as if words like the use of the word ethnicity or the use of the word an, um, ancestry do not have histories. That these are not non-fraught terms, but somehow I think people are thinking of words like race, uh, uh, words as ethnicity and ancestry are non-fraught. And so I think that we need to have more histories of looking at these words too because they have, have histories. Where are we now? I mean, I think one of the, my concerns is that people are still thinking about race as biology. Biology and race um, influencing traits. There's now, um, talking about being resurrected, there's now research being done on the whole links between crime and genes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it was that battle I thought we had fought, but we're going to be needing to fight um, um, that one again. And the other thing in terms of race is that there are some people who don't see it as a reality. The whole colorblind society, which, which Dorothy talks about in terms of a post-racial society. And then how do, how do we use it? How do black people use the word race? I mean, because the whole thing about race as biology is not just the purview of scientists. That there are many uh, African Americans who believe that it's part of their essence. 
Now, I um, want to leave, because so, I know we want to have some time for questions, some of the unanswered questions. And one of the major ones is that here we have a macro study in terms of what to do on a policy level. I teach medical students. So what do, when we talk about race as a social construct, how do we get that across? It's clear that we don't have the faculty who, to, who understand some of these issues, but how do we teach students? And I want to uh, show you what I mean. You're a physician. Dorothy comes in. I come in. When you, and you have that 10 minute getting even shorter encounter with a patient. So you need the shorthand in terms of looking at risk. So do you see two black women academics? So that puts us in a different class. Mm -hmm. So you might think that, well, you know, they, they have certain risk factors, you know, or not risk factors because uh, Dorothy's living out in Evanston and um, I'm living in a so-called Tony area of uh, DC. Uh, so, you know, certain things you don't have to worry about. So do you put us all in the same category or do you start getting into who we are? I mean, one of the, I think, the highlights of the book is that Dorothy was not afraid to put her personal story in the book. So here's Dorothy, whose father is white. Her mother was born in Jamaica. I mean, I know I have white ancestors, but they're not that close. <laughs> Um, that, you know, the, the fact that, you know, Dorothy grew up in more privileged circumstances than I. I mean, my mother was a single mother. Um, Dorothy says in her book that politically she has allegiance to people whose ancestors were enslaved in the South. I know, as a matter of fact, that on my grandfather's side, that my on my, on my mother's side, that my paternal great grandparents were slaves. So you have these these histories, which will influence who we are, our health status, how you know. But how do we use the language? And what language should we use? And in a country where, as I said, that. 10 minute encounter is getting even shorter. So I think that, you know, Dorothy has given us a lot of food for thought. And I think that knowing Dorothy as a scholar and as an activist, the challenge for us is to figure out what to do with this. So uh, I think I've read every academic word that Professor Roberts has ever written and loved it, but nothing prepared me for fatal invention. It's a masterpiece. It ranges across disciplines. It's eloquent. It's persuasive. And I don't think that there's a, a, a non-formally trained scientist uh, writer a non-scientist who writes so clearly about science. So I love this book. It, it, it's, it's amazing. So here's my conundrum after reading it. I want my doctor, <laughs> but not the police, to notice that I'm black. <laughs> but I want my doctor to see my color, but I don't, to, to, to know about race. But I, I don't want the police to. Okay. So Dorothy and I have the same publisher. Our publisher likes stories. Uh, Dorothy tells great stories, including about some of her own experiences in the book. So just uh, right now and then at the end, two stories about calls from my mom. So when I turned 40, my mother kept bugging me to get a PSA test to see if I had any markers for prostate cancer. So when I went for my checkup, I asked my doctor who for the record, is, is Latino. He's also an amazing physician to do the test. He asked why. I said, well, black men are advised to start getting that test at the age of 40. 
My doctor said that I didn't need the test. He said that because of my income and the quality of my health care and the level of my fitness and nutrition, that medically speaking, I'm white. <laughs> I was so proud. <laughs> the first person I called was my mother. She knew I was going to the doctor, so her question was, well, oh, did you get the test? I said, no, ma, us white guys don't need it <laughs> until we turn 50. <laughs> so you can imagine my mother's reaction. <laughs> The, the context is that she lived all of her life in the hometown of Dorothy and me, Chicago. Great passages in Fatal Invention about Chicago, the level of white supremacy there, and the results. Black women um, dying earlier um, of breast cancer, the mortality gap between black and white men there, the alarming rates of asthma among African American children. My mother said, boy, have you lost your mind. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong, nobody understands culture and is prouder of race progress than my mom. But her intuition was that there's still something sticky about race, that no matter how much of a, a so social construct it is, um, I was a black man who was turning 40 and I needed to have a PSA test. Um, I think she saw something about genetics in that. My mother's not a scientist and she doesn't have nearly Professor Roberts' awareness of the science, but she did have this intuition that there is something st sticky about race, uh, an intuition that, an argument even, that, that gained some credence um, from me this April when for the first time I went to the pen relays. Now, there may be only one human race, but when you go to the pen relays, pen relays race seems like something more than a, a political system. So the pen relays for people who haven't been are um, yeah, a major track meet. Um, they're all relays. Um, the stars are people who are some of the fastest runners in the world. And to take it beyond the level of antidote, if you look at the, um, the statistics, uh, of the 100 fastest runners in the world, about 80 of them are black. The National Basketball Association is about 80% black as well. The National Football League is about 60% black. Now, my argument isn't that white men can't jump. <laughs> but I do submit that there's something that's going on that's, that's thicker than culture, and, and it's thicker than socially constrained ambition. And I know that culture and socially constrained ambition have a lot to do with who plays professional football and basketball but I don't know if they explain the 80%. Uh, I, I'm understand, I understand also, and as scared of, I'm as scared as all of you about whether people are gonna go from, from basketball to, to IQ, and they probably they will. They are, they already they are. are. They are. But we are at least Professor Roberts we're scientists, mm -hmm. so I don't think we can afford to be afraid of, of the basketball. There's something going on there, again, that I submit is thicker than culture. So what about this, this notion of, of social construct? Ra race isn't the only social construct, although it certainly is one. Uh, homosexuality is another one, or, or so we thought. Now, in, in the words of the noted genomicist Lady Gaga, 
we, we understand that, that gay people were born that way. Now, for the GLBT community, that's an attractive claim for legal reasons. Uh, under constitutional law, you get more protection for immutable characteristics. I, I'm interested in, in the way that this community is, the gay community has, has embraced this, this idea of, of biology or genetics and, and the ways that the um, African American community has all of the appropriate concerns that, that Professor Roberts lets us know we, sh we should have. So she's persuaded me about the ways that biological race might be misused. But, but I'm also concerned uh, about the ways that a, a social construct of race, a, a non-biological construct, the idea that race isn't biology, about the ways that they might be misused. Again, starting with, but not ending with, with constitutional law. So again, the schizophrenia that I have about, about racial profiling, police bad, doctors good, is consistent with, with many of my fellow race theorists. On uh, colorblindness, we tend to go back and forth. We want colorblindness for, for police. We want it for immigration authorities. We don't want colorblindness when, when politicians are drawing up uh, congressional districts. Uh, we don't want it for the admissions committee at Northwestern Law School. Are, are we trying to have it both ways? So uh, for colorblindness in, in my area, uh, criminal justice, it comes up mainly in the context of the police and whether they should uh, racially profile. And, and there are really, there are about three main points of view that I want to try to map on to Professor Roberts and her work. So one idea is that racial profiling is rational. It helps the police catch the bad guys and they should do it. If you're a customs agent, an immigration agent, trying to figure out who might be illegally entering the country, of course you should notice and pay more attention to people who look Latino if you're at the border between the United States and Mexico. It just makes sense. Now, there's a, 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 a Sixth Circuit case, a federal appellate case, where the court's talking about profiling in another context of blacks uh, who might be carrying drugs and airplanes. And the court says, facts can't be ignored because they're unpleasant. And some races commit some certain kinds of crimes more than other races. We were, this weren't so, but, but it's the reality, and we have to accept the truth, not what we'd like the world to be. So again, that's one point of view. Racial profiling is rational. Uh, another is that it's irrational. It doesn't help cops catch the bad guys, and that's why they shouldn't do it. So if terrorists know that everybody is looking for uh, people who look Muslim, or Arab, then they're going to recruit the blonde-haired, blue-eyed white woman. So it just doesn't make sense. And, and then the third point of view is that it's rational, racial profiling is, but it's un-American. It's immoral. So maybe the police could catch a few more bad guys if they paid attention to race. Um, but that's not what we do in the United States. In the US, we judge people by the content of their characters, not the color of, of their skin. So when I, I thought about Professor Roberts' views about how scientists could use or should use race and genetics, uh, I didn't always hear her saying that it was um, irrational, right? Um, as Professor Gamble notes, um, a, a lot of what doctors do, um, we like it to be more particularized, but you have 10 minutes, so they have to, to go on what they observe. And, and race is an imperfect 
proxy, but pretty much all of the proxies are imperfect, right? So again, it, it's not going to give you everything we hope, and you've got to look at it with some, uh, you've got to critically think about it as data, uh, but it is a data point, and it's not necessarily an unuseful data point. And, and then the idea that, yes, but, but look at how it's used. Um, again, that sounds kind of like the argument that it's, it's rational, but it's un-American, it's immoral, or it might have all of these unintended consequences. So again, I don't have any conclusions there, just kind of uh, thinking interestingly about um, racial profiling in these different contexts, in science and in law enforcement. And just a couple things, you know, um, when I was writing my book about criminal justice, uh, my publisher, our publisher liked it, but come on, can't you say something positive? This is so destructive. What, what's constructive uh, about this work? And, and so uh, I didn't have a good answer to that question. I, I'm hoping that Professor Roberts will. Um, one way I thought about that is, well, what are the progressive uses of this technology? Um, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, right? Mm -hmm. So since the genie is out, uh, how can we use it to help? And actually, I, I, I did, in, in my work, think of one way. I was being um, alarmist, appropriately so, as, as Professor Roberts is, about a, a particular kind of technology. The technology I was being alarmist about is, is GPS technology that allows the police to track you wherever you go. Fun fact here in the District of Columbia, um, they give students uh, metro passes to take the um, train to school if they can't afford to buy the passes on their own. Um, but there have been concerns about kids wilding out on the subways, and so they're going to change it now to only um, allow the cards to work during school hours. So all the kids have to turn in their old cards and get new ones. The new ones include GPS technology. So wherever a kid goes with this uh, Metro card, law enforcement will be able to find out. Well, that's kind of scary. It's technology, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. In my book, I suggest, well, maybe one thing we might do is to use this GPS technology as an alternative to incarceration. Since we can track where people go, um, maybe we can do something that isn't great, but is more humane than locking people up in cages for five or 10 years. Um, maybe we could say you have to stay at your house and you wear this GPS device so we know where you are at all times. Again, not great, but, but better than what we do now. So um, again, a progressive use of technology that whether we like it or not is here. And, and, and in that line, um, you know, the, the, the story that Professor Roberts tells about this heart failure drug, it, it's, it's such a great writer. It's, it's like reading science fiction, and, and that's <laughs> almost like reading magical realism, this, this heart drug that is designed, or not designed, but marketed towards African American people. But there's another way of telling that story, I think, that that's, that's more hopeful than the story about it that Professor Roberts tells. The reason that the idea that the drug should be marketed to African Americans came from the fact that the clinical study only included African Americans. And, and so one way of looking at that is if a study only includes a certain group of people, and you really only know about that certain group of people. In a way, I thought that's what black feminists have been trying to teach us all along, right? <laughs> yeah. So if it, it had only been white men, then we might not know. We complain about that, right? If it's a study only of white men, well, what does this tell us about African-American women? You know, all of the, the men are white, all of the um, blacks are women. 
But maybe, Professor Roberts, some of these studies are brave. They're doing what we hope that they would do, which is to not overclaim. And so maybe, in a way, the idea that if a study only includes African Americans, it really only knows about African Americans is actually the culmination of some of your, the ironic culmination <laughs> of some of your work and your um, organization's important work in, in black feminism. So last story and end is another call from my mother. Um, <laughs> so it, it's about a, a photograph, again, in, in our hometown, a photograph in a hotel in Chicago. The hotel's the Palmer House this legendary hotel downtown where, where all these famous singers used to perform back in the day. N now, if you go in the hallways of this hotel, you can see some photographs of, of performances at this hotel from the 1950s and 60s. And, and one photo, which was taken in the, in the 50s, you see this light-skinned black woman. It's a photo of Carol Channing, except that in the 1950s, Carol Channing was white, or, or what's called passing for white. She didn't come out as African American into the 2000s. I called my mother. How could you not have known? It's so obvious. It's just obvious to you, she said, because you know that she's black. There's something very powerful about this racial gaze. You know, Carol Channing is known for playing all these daffy roles like in Hello, Dolly, but in this photograph, she does not look daffy. She looks very serious. She looks like she knows that she's lying, but she looks like she knows that she's lying about something that is a lie. She looks very sober. She looks like she sees the future and that she's not particularly optimistic about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you, for those wonderful comments. Uh, we've reached the end of our time, but I know there are probably many questions, so if you have to leave, please leave, but if you can stay, please stay, and uh, we will um, welcome your questions. Please wait, raise your hand, and, and wait for the mic, and uh, identify yourself um, over here, Steve. Yeah. My name is Stephen Shore. Two brief questions. The first is, I'm not quite clear. I thought there was a marvelous presentation of how much is the image of race an American problem, and how mm -hmm. much is it a u human problem? Mm -hmm. Of course, there are United States studies, but we're hardly the only nation afflicted with um, mis misconceptions about race. And the other about profiling, that I think if you police profile young black men in expensive cars, they will uh, undoubtedly find more drug couriers. But there have been a um, number of incidents of black undercover policemen killed by their white colleagues in the line of duty as a consequence of racial profiling. Okay. So um, I decided in this book to focus on the United States. Otherwise, I would have had to cut more than 100 pages that I had to cut from it uh, to make it manageable. But you're absolutely right that race and the biological concept of race uh, is present across the world. Uh, and um, But on the other hand, one piece of evidence that race is a political system, that it's a social grouping, is that the definitions of race differ across the world. And so I point out in the book that since Paul has mentioned my um, ancestry, was it Vanessa? You, you mentioned, okay, so, so in the book, if I, at, when I was born, if I was born in South Africa, I would have been considered colored. If I was born in Brazil, there were at least eight categories that I might have fallen into. So uh, I think the biological concept of race has traveled globally 
partly because of because imperialism has traveled globally, but it also demonstrates that it's a political system because of these differences uh, around the world. I think it would it, it would it's very important though to also think about the global consequences of a biological concept of race, what it means for medical research around the globe, and what it means for uh, global inequalities that uh, are shaped by race as well. Um, I, I think probably you want Professor Butler to answer the question about profiling, but let me just mention that many studies have shown that uh, it's actually inefficient when police officers stop blacks uh, for traffic violations and look for drugs that they yield fewer uh, actual um, uh, contraband uh, than when they stop white people for drugs. So I, I don't agree that it's efficient to just to stop black people to you know for for uh, fake traffic infractions in order to uh, find uh, drugs. And I think your example shows the very horrific consequences of the perpetuation of a view of the black race as being prone to crime. And there's, I mentioned some of this in my book, very interesting work by social psychologists about the implicit uh, stereotypes linking race and criminality, also linking race and apes black people and apes. I, sh I shouldn't say race and criminality, black people and criminality, and black people and the image of an ape, which comes from the history of thinking about blacks as being closer to primates and whites as the, you know, the, the pinnacle of uh, the human species. That idea has been carried down for centuries, and uh, some studies are showing that many Americans have that in their minds, even if they don't express it or acknowledge it. It's implicit, and that it lends uh, to the, the very story you talked about, the, the, uh, the willingness of police officers and others to use violence uh, against blacks who are suspected of crime. Yeah, I mean, just, just that, and another problem with um, racial profiling is it leads to, to lazy policing um, that, in common with the uh, science or distortion of science that Professor Roberts describes, um, kind of creates this, this cycle. So the statistics get misused. The police especially focus on young black men for drugs, and they end up finding more drugs than young black men if the police decided to focus on, on law professors at George Washington, many more of my colleagues would be under criminal justice supervision. <laughs> it turns out that there's a, this important relationship between looking for things and finding things. And the concern about laziness, I think, also goes to Professor Roberts' observations. Um, I had a, um, a low white blood cell count. Um, my doctor, investigated, root out all of the most common explanations and ended up, oh, well, you're black. And more black people, descendants of a certain variant, he, he trusted in, in genetics as well, mm -hmm. a certain group from Africa, um, have a low white blood count. It's nothing to worry about. That was sufficient for him. It, it wasn't sufficient for me. But again, it, it's- Wouldn't been sufficient for me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but again, it, it leads to these <laughs> lazy, um, policing and, and, and lazy medicine. Yeah, here please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Georgia Dunstan. I'm the founding director of the National Human Genome Center at Howard University. First, I want the record to show that I certainly want to commend the Wilson uh, International Center and the Black Women's Health Imperative for this session. Um, the speakers and the commentator, the, the, the author and the commentators, exquisite. Because time is short, my comment is, first I'd like to make one comment, mm -hmm. and then I would like to 
just relate that to the concluding remark of the author and the commentators. Mm -hmm. First, I'm impressed with a statement from credited to Albert Einstein. You cannot solve a problem at the same level of thinking or consciousness that creates the problem. Mm -hmm. And the significance here is our author left us with an eloquent scholarly presentation of the challenge before us with regard to race. But she left the possibility that what direction we will go with it and where our scholarship will lead us is going to be determined by us, how we use the information. I appreciated Vanessa's bringing to the table the fact that in spite of this scholarly history that was well articulated, there's always been, from the beginning of history, there's always been an, a challenging idea to the dominant paradigm. It's always been a challenge uh, there. Our second. Professor Butler, <laughs> I appreciated your tempered way of thinking that necessarily the dominant view would prevail as it has historically. <laughs> uh, and your willingness to show some reservation about whether we have sufficient data to think that it will be any different. It will be different. <laughs> because of today's panel. This panel presents what I think are the key things that will make the difference. One, who's telling the story? Who's telling the story? And they both have brought our attention to a major factor in the story that's been told. We cannot miss the role that who controls the media who control what story is being told <laughs> supersedes who's telling the story <laughs> because Professor Roberts has told the story quite eloquently and with impeccable scholarship. But it is scholarship that's looking at solutions to the problem at the same level that the problem is excellent scholarship. The opposing view that Professor Gamma challenged us is that science is powerful. As, as Professor has said, science is powerful. But how we apply the science, the two stories that they gave, just take this in mind. That Bideal story, yes, it's gotten a lot of press on what was said. 49% of black people did indeed do better, so much so that they said it's now unethical not to continue the study you don't hear a lot about the 51% of the same African-American community that did not respond <laughs> positively to the drug. The majority, they were just as black as the ones that did not respond. So what's going to be the dilemma? Are we going to now make them not black? And what's the dilemma we're presenting to the physician who now has to consider whether they may be charged with malpractice if they don't follow guidelines as to how you are to treat blacks. And it is a major issue. Your issue now that we go to medical, we go to electronic health records that are going to decide what the guidelines are based on the data that's input. <laughs> We've got a situation before us that we have to address what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, this was timely. It's who's telling the story and who controls the media, because no matter how great the scholarship has been over the course of this history, <laughs> if you didn't tell your story in a way that was acceptable by those controlling how the story would get out, you still had to. So communication. And so the fact that this is the internet age and we have to look at who controls the information that is disseminated is something we have to factor in. Thank you. Responses? 
I absolutely agree that uh, <laughs> the um, my book largely is, as Vanessa said, a clarion call to pay attention to uh, what many scientists are continuing to tell about race. But I also firmly believe that, as I say at the end of the book, the history of black political struggle in particular can be a model for how to integrate new genomic uh, discoveries in, with a political understanding of race to present an alternative way of uh, examining the meaning of our humanity at the genetic level, but also to understand that race is a political system. I, I think it's consistent to say race is a political system, but still to understand that race has an impact on health and uh, that the challenges uh, to come up with the, the meat uh, and bones of, or to put meat on the bones of this idea uh, that there are alternative ways of thinking about human genetic diversity and thinking about race that don't continue the pattern of three centuries of science. So I, I appreciate your comments. Vanessa, do you want to add anything? No. no. Uh, yeah, I know that Matt, Matt, Matt is a, are one of my staff members, and he, he and I have been having long discussions about this book, and I know he has a question. Uh, uh, thank you, Sonia. Uh, I was, I, I've been really excited about the book. I've mm -hmm. been reading it now. And uh, yesterday I was just finishing the part about um, race-based pharmaceuticals in a Starbucks. And I looked over at the community bulletin board and I saw um, Howard University was doing a study. Are you an African-American woman overweight? Mm -hmm. Well, take this, uh, take this tag and, and come and, and get studied about how African-American women respond to different, um, I guess they were studying some reactions to different types of, of um, treatments or drugs or uh, whatever it is inside yeah. the medicines. So I, I was like, I wonder what Professor Roberts would say about th that advertisement. Mm -hmm. I wonder if she would, would uh, put that inside her own, her own thing. But mm -hmm. I was just thinking of, about that. But the other thing was what um, Professor Butler raised, and it was a question I talked with Sonia before. I, ma I screened my question with her to, to make sure it was <laughs> worthy. Uh, and that was this idea of trying to find the homosexual gene. Um, I kind of interpreted your book to suggest that there is a moral injury related to trying to find the African-American gene or the white gene or the Asian gene. It, maybe, I'm, maybe I misinterpreted that, that message, mm -hmm. but do you think that there is a moral injury? I think Professor Butler mentioned a legal implications of either doing away with the research or continuing. Do you, would you lump that goal of some scientists in with uh, this racial science? Mm -hmm. Well, let me first be clear about what I'm saying about race. I'm saying that race is a political social grouping. I am not saying that human beings don't differ from each other at the genetic level. I'm not saying that populations of people don't differ. I'm not saying ancestry doesn't matter. But race in particular is a social grouping and so it is often used in an unscientific and sloppy way in genomic and genetic uh, and, and in, in medical uh, diagnoses. I don't think race as a social group is, the, is a good <laughs> proxy for the kinds of genetic descriptions or uh, distinctions or medical distinctions that are being made in research and in diagnoses. Um, it's just, you know, it's not just an imperfect proxy, it's a bad proxy. And I, and I think that 
uh, the research that um, some scientists are doing to uh, come up with better ways of predicting whether someone has a, a particular genetic variant, like, for example, testing them for it, uh, would be better than assuming that because someone is of a particular race, they belong to a social category, that they're going to have this genetic variant. So um, I'm not throwing out uh, the importance of genes, but I am saying that race is not a genetic category, and also, though, that when it comes to race, which is a social category, it is Im more important to understand how the social inequalities that stem from racism work with genes than to look at it as a proxy for genes. And I would also say, in my opinion, that uh, we don't uh, spend enough funding and attention to the role of social inequality on health uh, and address that um, in, uh, more directly than we are today. Um, now, so, you know, when Paul, uh, do, uh, Professor Butler, when he says, I want my doctor to notice I'm black, well, I don't know, you might not <laughs> necessarily, I mean, sometimes that can hurt you, too. Uh, if the doctor assumes that because you're black, you either have or don't have some condition, when there are better ways of determining, like family history. I mean, why family history is... Your drug seeking. Well, th that's, uh, you know, there are other, I think there are other incentives for dividing people according to race to produce drugs, but that's not because race is the best way to do it scientifically. Um, I'm a little uh, reluctant to um, express an opinion, a definitive opinion about uh, the um, question of homosexuality and biology. Um, I don't, only because I, you know, before I express a definitive opinion about something, I like to do research about it, and also I like to work in the area with activists uh, who understand uh, both the science but also the political implications. And that's not to say that politics is more important than science, or can, but to say that they're interrelated. I mean, this is my point that science is inextricably tied to politics. You cannot separate the two. They've never been separated. And so to me, the statement that I need to work with people who are political activists, who are politically savvy, is not a statement to say I want to be unscientific at all. It's to understand the political context in which scientific claims are being made. Um, I don't believe that race, sexual orientation, and gender are equivalent categories. Uh, and so I would not equate my analysis of race with an analysis of um, gay and lesbian or transgender identity or with um, an analysis of gender. Uh, and so you, I don't think you can just translate or uh, transpose uh, conclusions about the history and the meaning and the science of race to these other categories because they're not the same. Um, I will say, though, that uh, in judging claims that uh, being gay stems from genetic difference, I would be very critical of that, and I would um, uh, examine it and investigate it very, very carefully. 
um, before accepting it. Uh, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Yeah, um, this is going to have to be, please make it brief because we're going to have to wrap up and then we'll just give our panelists. Wait, can you just get the mic? Yeah. Uh, my name is Jim Byrne. I'm a journalist and uh, had the great good fortune of hanging out with good companions all my life on issues of race and others. Uh, I was for seven years an editor of a magazine at the Center for National Policy Review of great civil rights organization. And then I was the editor of a healthcare disparities report in the short life it had of about two years. And we were quite a mixture racially and, and uh, uh, in, in terms of women and, and uh, the like. And you know, we came away feeling pretty sophisticated. But today you guys added so much to my understanding of w these issues. And I urge you to be evangelists <laughs> for what you have found. Thanks. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. Um, Vanessa, you want to have some closing thoughts? No, I just wanted to just, um, as I said, this is a clarion call, I think, to what we do. But the other thing is it also brings us into other research, getting to the question about gender. Because after reading Dorothy's book, uh, the same week that the Institute of Medicine had a report out about uh, contraception and in terms of having uh, having contraception be a part of health care, not just reproductive health care. You know, I looked at the list who was on the panel, and there is a professor of gender biology. And one, one of, and for me, you know, I've, you know, I've been thinking about this for a while. Why are, um, it, it, I took the Society for the Advancement of Women's Health and some of the language they use about differences between men and women, the differences in the biology. And if you put the word race in that, mm -hmm. that um, there would be a problem. Mm -hmm. And so what's different about it? And so that I think that one of the things that Dorothy's book does do also is points us to the way, I said there are unanswered questions, mm -hmm. and to bring up more mm -hmm. questions. And so that's uh, what it's done for me. But the other thing that there's a certain optimism uh, for me in this book because I know a lot of the characters in it. <laughs> uh, and to see some people who a few years ago would say it's all biology, it's all genetics, saying, you know, maybe social factors have something to do with it. So that, you know, I think that if we keep at it, there is the possibility of change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Professor Butler? This is a brilliant book. It's eloquently written. <laughs> Tell everybody you know to read it. <laughs> Dorothy? Uh, well, I will just uh, close by saying that um, a lot of the book is meant to be alarming. Uh, but I do ultimately see it as uh, an optimistic book because I think that there is a hope for changing the, what I see as a trend toward the redefinition of race as biology. Uh, and I look to the history of struggle against that concept that has gone on for centuries uh, as a, a source for optimism. So I uh, appreciate uh, all of you who are left here <laughs> waiting till the end and uh, hope that you will um, take this message with you uh, and think about these questions and think about what we can do to um, focus on the social and changing the social inequalities that continue to persist because of the system of race. Thanks. <laughs>